India begins Operation Kaveri to bring back Indian citizens stranded in Sudan. 500 Indians reach Port Sudan for transfer to Saudi. More reported en route as multiple nations pull out their nationals. Death toll in the Kenyan starvation cult rises to 58. Kenyan Red Cross says 112 people were reported missing. Bodies of people who had starved themselves recovered from mass graves in Shakola Forest in eastern Kenya. Britain sets up $125 million task force to develop artificial intelligence foundation model chatbots. They will be deployed in fields like healthcare and education. The government puts the upcoming elections at the Indian Wrestling Federation on hold as the grapplers approach the Supreme Court seeking an FIR against the WFI Chief Bridge Bhushan Singh. Hi everyone, welcome to We On Live broadcast from New York City. I'm Susan Tehrani. You listen to our headlines, let's go for, uh, straight to our first story. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is in the United States representing Russia, which took up the presidency of the 15-member Security Council in April. Lavrov is set to chair two Security Council meetings in New York and has condemned the decision taken by the United States to not deny entry visas to Russian journalists. He says the U.S. has, quote unquote, chickened out. Moreover, Lavrov has suggested that Moscow will take strong retaliatory measures against the United States. A country that calls itself the strongest, smartest, free and fair country has chickened out and done something stupid by showing what its own assurances about protecting freedom of speech and access to information are really worth. Of course, I understood how famous our American colleagues are for this kind of thing. But I was sure that this time, given the attention drawn to their ugly behavior, everything would be different. And I was wrong. One of the signature events of Russia's council presidency is a ministerial level open debate on effective multilateralism through the defense of principles of the UN Charter, which the Russian foreign minister is expected to chair. Russia has circulated a concept note ahead of the meeting outlining its views on the international order and the UN system. It argues, quote, a deep reaching systematic transformation is underway with what some experts call the natural and rapid decline of the unipolar world and the emergence of a new multipolar world. Lavrov is also set to meet UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Russia has warned that the prospects for allowing the safe wartime expert of grain and fertilizer from Ukraine's Black Sea ports beyond May 18th is, quote, not so great. Meanwhile, when asked for a response to Moscow's reaction, the U.S. State Department said regarding those visas that it routinely issues visas to Russians for U.N. events. It also pointed to longstanding concerns on restrictions on staffing the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, which has been down to a skeleton crew since the conflict began. The dispute comes in the wake of high tensions with Washington over the arrest of last month of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gersovich, whom Russia accused of espionage. Moreover, he is the first foreign journalist arrested on spying allegations since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is on a four-country trade tour, starting with Japan, where he met the country's prime minister discussing potential economic opportunities. DeSantis lauded U.S.-Japan bilateral ties and praised the country's military expansion, emphasizing Japan's commitment as a U.S. ally. DeSantis appreciated the Japanese defense buildup in the face of China and North Korea's expanding military might. 
referring to the bilateral partnership, he said, quote, We very much applaud your efforts to bolster your defense and believe that a strong Japan is good for America. The probable U.S. presidential candidate is on a foreign visit to strengthen foreign policy credentials after receiving flack for his comments on the Russia-Ukraine war, essentially calling it a territorial dispute. DeSantis responded uh, on the question of his presidential candidature for the 2024 elections. This is what he had to say. I'm not, I'm not a candidate, so we'll see if, uh, if and when that changes. The Florida governor is expected to meet Japanese foreign minister as well on Monday before continuing with his tour to South Korea, Israel and the United Kingdom. <laughs> Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden has selected Julie Chavez Rodriguez a senior advisor at the White House and deputy campaign manager of his 2020 presidential campaign to be his campaign manager for the 2024 presidential elections. Sources say Rodriguez, who is the director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, has agreed to take on the role. But who is Julia Chavez Rodriguez, who is being touted as campaign manager for Biden's re-election campaign? Well, Chavez Rodriguez was a deputy campaign manager on Biden's general election team back in 2020, as we mentioned. After a stint as traveling chief of staff on Vice President Kamala Harris's unsuccessful bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. Before that, she worked in Harris's Senate office as a senior official in the Office of Public Engagement in President Barack Obama's White House and as the director of the programs at the Cesar E. Chavez Foundation. Joe Biden is expected to officially announce his bid for the presidency as early as Tuesday on the fourth anniversary of his 2020 campaign launch. Moreover, President Biden is gearing up for what could be a bruising campaign. His team has been eyeing Wilmington, Delaware, where Biden has a home as the base for the campaign. And the long-awaited Biden campaign is ramping up at a time when former President Donald Trump has taken a commanding lead in polls among Republican primary contenders and potential candidates. Most national surveys show a tight race and a possible rematch. Peru has ordered to put one of its former presidents behind bars. A former president, Alejandro Toledo, was extradited from the U.S. on Sunday. A Toledo became the third head of state to be imprisoned as the South American country struggles to shake off years of corruption by its top leaders. 77-year-old Toledo has been ordered to serve a pretrial detention of 18 months inside a police base on the outskirts of the capital, Lima. Former President Alberto Fujimori and Pedro Castillo are also held at the same prison. Citing health issues, a Toledo's lawyer told reporters that he would seek permission for him to be placed under house arrest instead. Toledo served as Peru's president between 2001 and 2006. He turned himself in on Friday for extradition from the United States and arrived on Sunday morning at the airport in Lima. Peruvian authorities have accused Toledo of receiving $35 million in bribes from a Brazilian construction company in exchange of a highway contract. Prosecutors have demanded a 20-year prison sentence for Toledo, who has denied the charges of money laundering and collusion. Supporters gathered outside the court to show their support to the former president. The extradition process began back in 2018. Toledo had been declared a fugitive in the country the previous year when he fled to the United States amid corruption investigations against him and others. Military experts from around the world feel that China intends to be the global net security provider overtaking the United States in this respect. When it comes to emerging and disruptive technology, China already has a lead over the United States in some aspects, but Chinese military analysts want China to do more in the field of laser weapons. 
They have urged the Chinese government to speed up development of laser weapons to keep pace with swift progress made by the United States. The U.S. Government Accountability Office said last week that the Pentagon is spending $1 billion per year on developing directed energy weapons to counter threats such as drones and missiles. It said much recent research has focused on making laser weapons small and light enough to be used by one person. However, the U.S. is still facing challenges in moving beyond the prototype stage. Laser weapons are seen as a good solution to the use of drone swarms, which have been widely used in modern conflict, such as the Ukrainian war. A laser beam can confuse drones' optical sensor or even burn a hole when its power is increased. The United States has been researching the technology since the 1960s. The country is a front runner in developing and using directed energy weapons, but China has also been researching the use of laser weapons. It had had some success in such as the Silent Hunter, an anti-drone system developed by Poly Technologies. In March last year, Saudi Arabia used the technology to intercept and destroy 13 suicide drones operated by Houthi militants in Yemen. But experts believe China needs to put more effort into developing high-powered laser weapons. Global military expenditures rose to a record high last year. This is according to a report by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. The report says that this historic figure is a reflection of how insecurity or how insecure the world currently is amid heightened tensions across the globe. As per this report, total global military expenditure for the year 2022 stands at $2.24 trillion dollars. This is a rise of 3.4% than what it stood at 2021 in real terms. The sharpest rise in military spending has been seen in Europe, which has increased by 13%. The expenditure in Central and Western Europe totaled $345 billion in 2022. Increasingly, such expenditure levels have not been seen in the continent since the Cold War. The rise in European defense expenditure, as obvious, is largely accounted by Russia and Ukrainian spending. But many other countries in the continent have increased their spending, either to supply weapons to Ukraine or due to fears of meeting the same fate as Ukraine. Coming to the specifics, Russian military spending grew by an estimated 9.2% in 2022. It stands at $86.4 billion and is more than 4% of its GDP in 2022. On the other side, Ukraine's military spending reached $44 billion in 2022, with a rise of 640%. This is the highest single-year increase in a country's military expenditure ever recorded in this report. Coming to its ally, the U.S., it remains the world's biggest military spender. Washington's military spending reached $877 billion in 2022. This is 39% of the total global military spending. Experts say that this rise is on the account of the military and military aid, that is, it had provided to Ukraine. This aid for the year 2022 stands at nearly $20 billion. While China comes at the second spot with an estimated expenditure of $292 billion, increasing budget by 4.2 percent since 2021, together the U.S., China and Russia account for 56 percent of the world's total. China's defense expenditure has been seen an increase for 28 consecutive years. India's defense spending is fourth highest in the world with $81.4 billion spent last year. It is 6% more than what it was in 2021. The defense budget of multiple nations have touched new highs. This clarifies that even in modern times, the priorities of the world have not changed. Smart guns enabled by facial recognition are on sale here in the United States. Colorado-based BioFire Tech is taking orders for high-tech guns. It's the latest development in personalized weapons that can only be fired by verified user. 
The firearm is a brainchild of BioFire founder and CEO Akai Kloper. The gun has a design with a different look than other traditional handguns, along with facial recognition. It also has fingerprint reader to unlock the gun. All right. The key thing is, not only is it always locked, but it's also instantly accessible. And so what that means is as soon as the user starts to interact with the firearm, it immediately wakes up, recognizes their biometrics using our garden, Guardian biometric system, uh, and then stays unlocked for as long as they're holding on to it. There are concerns that the smart gun could be hacked, but the company thinks that's unlikely as it is completely a closed system. The system has no Wi-Fi, GPS, or network connectivity of any kind. The first consumer-ready version of the 9mm handgun could be shipped to customers as soon as the fourth quarter of this year. Two other American companies, Lodestar Works and Free State Firearms, are also attempting to get a smart gun on the market in a gun culture built largely on the need for self-defense, at a moment's notice, many gun enthusiasts have become skeptical of the smart gun technology. Non-resident Indians, or NRIs as we call them, have given Indians yet another milestone to cherish NRIs sent over $100 billion to India last year. A World Bank report showed India became the first country to reach the $100 billion landmark in money inflow. But what does it mean for India and its economy? Here's a report to tell you more. India's global economic footprint receives a major boost. India is now the first country to cross the $100 billion mark in remittances. Remittances, in simple terms, are the money sent to India by Indians living or working abroad. The milestone must not come as a surprise. As India has the largest diaspora in the world, over 18 million people, and in crossing the $100 billion mark, India not only retained the top spot, but also pushed China to the second spot. So, which are the top sources of remittances for India? Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Australia, the US and the UK top the list. There are some solid reasons for these countries featuring in the top five. Reason number one higher vaccinations and the resumption of travel meant migrants could go back to work in the Gulf. Reason number two, the benefits of higher oil prices also helped overseas workers send more money to their families back in India. Reason number three, highly skilled Indian migrants from the US, UK and Australia could send more money due to job support programs during COVID-19. Reason four, Indian migrants likely also take advantage of a fall in the rupee against the US dollar. The rise in remittances is good news for India. That shows the world has rebounded from the pandemic lows and shows Indian diaspora has been growing strong across the world. The rise in remittances also helps fill the country's foreign exchange coffers. But perhaps the biggest help to remittances has been digitization with people now able to transfer money at the click of a button. Moving on to the world of sports, over at the NBA, champions Golden State Warriors held off a fourth-quarter comeback from the Sacramento Kings to tie the first-round series at 2-all. The Warriors dominated Game 3 on Thursday to pull one back in the series, they were without the suspended Draymond Green, and despite the four-time All-Star being available for Game 4, head coach Steve Kerr struck with the same lineup. Golden State controlled proceedings for most of the game. Reigning finals MVP Stephen Curry scored 32 points, but an error from the Warriors' tailsman almost cost Golden State the game. The Warriors were leading by five with 45 seconds left when Curry called a timeout but they had none left and had to hand over a possession. 
The Kings reduced the deficit to one point, but former warrior Harrison Barnes missed a buzzer-beating three-pointer as Curry breathed a huge sigh of relief. Game five of the best of seven series takes place in Sacramento on Wednesday. I knew we I, I knew we challenged, but I didn't realize when we lost the challenge that we didn't have any timeouts left. Um, I know Coach mentioned um, he took the blame for it. As I ain't going to lie, I thought it was the smartest play in the world. Uh, when I got the ball, turned around, saw a trap, realized there was no real outlets instead of turning it over. It's kind of the uh, the heady play, but it turned out not to be. I looked over at the bench, and everybody was shaking their head. <laughs> So it was an unfortunate situation in that respect, but good learning lesson. That's all the time we have for 